Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. As a business and healthcare law firm, details matter. Mm-hmm. This season's theme is Zoom In. Once we know our big picture, vision, or strategy, we have to roll up our sleeves to get the work done. With each episode this season, we'll have our typical stories and make sure we talk about specific actions to focus on for 2022. Love it. So, Michael, I was wondering, um, since it's just you and me and and no one else is listening right now, um, what are we going to talk about for today's show? Very funny, Brad. You know we have a special guest today. Yes, but you know, I, I think of the two of us, I'm like the really the free spirit of, a, of of the group, so I was trying to be more free spirit. Mm. Well, of the two of us, this is true, except I do think it's actually against the law for a lawyer to be a free spirit. That's probably right. But it is okay to be adventurous. Yes. And did you know that our guest today bungee jumped? over Victoria Falls in Africa on her recent honeymoon. Wow. So she's adventurous in two different ways. Number one, she bungee jumped off the world's largest waterfall and adventurous because she actually got married. Did she do it at the same time? You think she got married and jumped at the same time? Probably not. All right, Michael, let's let's focus back on you because I know you like that. What was the most adventurous thing you've ever done? Well, first, we need to call out those very dad jokey <laughs> of you to say, oh, she got married. Very adventurous. Um, but that's okay. We, What have I done? Well, I'm actually trying to avoid the question because uh, I'm far from a thrill seeker. Mm-hmm. So to paint the picture a little bit, when we used to go in junior high to Six Flags over Texas, which is a theme park. Yes. I was terrified to ride roller coasters, mm-hmm. and so, so I right. was also a less than confident uh, junior high age kid. So it was brutal to figure out how I was going to basically be a wallflower for an entire day with my entire class and oh, not get God. stuck on a roller coaster. And finally, I found one guy who was on the football team who would ride the uh the, the the basically the, the kids version <laughs> of a roller coaster, <laughs> the runaway mine train, which is not very scary. Yeah, and we rode that over and over again. There you go, you made a friend. But I did bungee jump once. Oh, is this so? You're in high school, right? So you probably were in high school when you bungee jumped, and is that the same time you're dating that girl from Niagara Falls? Ouch, Brad. We we said we weren't going to talk about that, and she was real. Yeah, sure. We all I had be. I had a sure. picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and too soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, actually, I bungee jumped off of a crane in South Padre Allen, Texas. So here's the footnote to my not being a thrill seeker. When we'll just say college, maybe a little earlier, I discovered alcohol, what? and it gives you confidence, <laughs> and so. I did start riding roller coasters in college if I had some confidence. And uh, and when I graduated from law school, I must have been having my first existential life crisis and had several beers and decided that it would be a good idea to jump, uh, bungee jump in South Padre Island. Uh, it was over 25 years ago. And, uh, and that actually, the bungee, the crane, is still there today where you can go and, and bungee jump. I'm but sure it's real safe. What about you? What was your most adventurous thing? Well, up until recently, probably a lot of people would think the most adventurous thing I've ever done was be a Saints fan uh, because for a long time the Saints were known as the Aints. And, you know, season after season, my poor dad and I would show up and we would, this is the season's going to work. And then, of course, we would lose again. Um, so, but that all obviously changed in 2009 when we won the Super Bowl. For those who didn't know, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't want to ruin the surprise, but yes, we did win a Super Bowl in 2009 with Drew Brees leading us there. However, if you polled my family, they would probably all agree that the time I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute um, to raise awareness for uh, some nonprofits that work with military and first responders. That probably would have been the most adventurous thing I did, and I would do it again tomorrow, but it most likely would be divorced because it was uh, – my wife did not like that idea of jumping out of planes. So I have two comments. Number one, 
Thank you for answering that question by saying partnering with you, Michael. <laughs> and number two, I totally agree because I remember the chaos uh, amongst your family, not just your wife, yes. your entire family revolted against Brad for yes, they did uh, for deciding to jump out of a plane. Yeah. Well, all right. No more adventure talk. Let's be more adventurous and bring on our guests today. Perfect. So joining us today is Amy Anderson. Amy graduated from Indiana University, both in undergrad and her MBA. She's a founding partner of Bryn- Brinson Anderson Consulting. Amy started working in the plastic surgery industry at 18, part-time at that time, and has uniquely worked every non-clinical job in that type of office setting. Uh, some have called her the surgeon whisperer, which makes me really jealous because I don't know if you remember Alex actually introduced me that way in San Diego. So we we may have to have a competition. I don't know. Um, she is married to Ben and who is a physician assistant in orthopedics and also, I guess, a bungee jumper. Uh, Yeah. Welcome, Amy. Good morning. Hi, Michael. Hi, Brad. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And and right before we started this podcast, uh, you you let out a little secret. This is your first time on a podcast. It is. I'm thrilled to be making my debut appearance with you guys. Well, you're definitely, you know, up until recently, we only did podcasts um, in which uh, we, we didn't have video. And now we have video because both of us have faces for radio. So we're glad <laughs> to have you on with us because that would definitely help. Uh, I think we'll just turn our camera off and just have Amy on the whole time. <laughs> Sounds that, like an idea. That's, yeah. That I think is a bit better idea. It was for sure get it off of Brad. Yes, <laughs> definitely off me. Well, so we're excited for you to have you today. And I think, you know, we've been talking about bunching jumping a lot. So let's start there. Uh, tell us uh, what was it like jumping off um, uh, the Victoria Falls. Yeah, so it was kind of a spur of the moment decision um, because who really plans to go bungee jumping? Yes, uh, we were on our honeymoon and um, we they they were offering it and we looked at each other and said, "Why not? Let's try this." Um, and the best description I have when Sid gets you all bound up, your your legs all tied together, and they have you kind of shuffle out to the edge of the platform. I feel like every cell in my body was screaming at me to get back, right? <laughs> the survival instinct of this is such a bad idea. Don't do it. Um, but they just count it down so fast, five, four, three, two, one, and you fling yourself off and you scream and it's the most <laughs> terrifying and thrilling experience ever. I don't need to ever do it again, um, but I'm glad to say I've, I've done it once. Fair enough. I would definitely brag about it if I had done it. That, that's amazing. And by the way, around six beers also helps <laughs> if you need that. I'll six. remember that next time. Yes. <laughs> around. But I've I've never uh, I have not been back myself either off a much much smaller jump. Yes. So, well, so let's. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more. And I'm curious. I'd love to hear about. Just your experiences starting in the business of plastic surgery at 18 and how you developed a passion for the aesthetic industry. Yeah, so I always tell people it's it's just amazing where life takes us and, and we set off down a path and it you know takes us in a different direction than we originally intend. So undergrad, I was pre-med. Um, I fully intended to go to medical school and I, it was my second semester of college and there's a plastic surgery group in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is where I grew up, that um, had just, two groups had just merged, and there was an opening for a phone operator. And let me tell you, I wasn't, I didn't even have a computer. I wasn't allowed to make an appointment. I literally just answered the phone and could transfer calls. I mean, it was that entry level. Um, But it was a great part-time job while I was in school. And um, that evolved into, I learned medical records. So yes, I am young enough to remember paper charts. Um, I grew up in the era era of paper charts and uh, learned the front desk, learned to work in the skincare spa, um, started doing prior authorizations for insurance. I basically said yes to any opportunity to learn a position. And when, by the time I got to the end of undergrad, I realized, I really liked working in the office um, and I just seemed to 
naturally be inclined to filling those different roles. I enjoyed being in medicine, being around surgeons. Um, I also developed an appreciation, not just for aesthetics, but all of plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, the surgeons there covered the burn unit. They did craniofacial surgery, lots of breast reconstruction. So I had a really well-rounded um, approach to plastic surgery. And then kind of fast forward, um, one of the doctors left and started his own practice. And I continued with him and became his practice manager, probably when I was too young and really had no business being the manager. But uh, we learned together. We made the mistakes together and, uh, you know, learn the lessons that experience will, will teach you. And so that just kind of I continued my career uh, down that path. Did you go get your MBA later or right out of school, under, out of undergrad? Yeah, right after undergrad, um, I, I was kind of applying to medical schools, um, deciding if I really wanted to commit the next 10 years of my life to more school and uh, decided to switch routes and, and do an MBA and, and stay on the business side of healthcare and realizing that I felt like I could still make a difference um, in people's lives and get have that fulfillment without being the person doing hands on patient care. When did you switch over to the consulting side of coming out, out of the day-to-day -day of working in the practice? Yeah, so I worked in a private practice, um, went to a children's hospital in Indianapolis for a few years, um, and was over all of the employee pediatric specialists there, went to a university, um, and was over an academic division, and so kind of had my experience in all of those different practice environments and uh, along the way, I had met Karen Zupko, who's, who's very well known in this space. And uh, she and I became friends and I really saw her as a mentor and connected with her again. And basically she asked if I had ever considered consulting. And so that was a dream come true. Um, certainly an honor to be invited by Karen Zupko to join her. So moved to Chicago, um, really trained with her, learned from the very best and uh, haven't looked back. I, I feel like I get to apply my experience in all of those different practice environments. And now I can share that with even more doctors as a consultant. I can work um, with several across um, specialties and across the country um, and work at a higher level and not necessarily get inundated with kind of the day-to-day -day operations that sometimes you know managers get stuck in. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know that this is going to really hurt Michael a lot, so I definitely want to ask this question. Why are you a better uh, surgeon whisperer than he is? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, who, I'm trying to think who originally called me that. Um, I, and I, I take, the, take it as quite a compliment. Um, I guess the best I can give is an example of um, I w one of the hospitals I worked at for a period of time, the COO called me in and, and offered me a position that really I had no business being offered um, to basically develop like the cancer service line, um, which I had no experience in. And, and I just asked him, I said, no, I'm really flattered, but why me? You know, what, what made you think of me for this? And he reflected back to a meeting we were in. There were probably 10 of us. And one of the surgeons was uh, very upset, very vocal about it. And he said, I saw the way you handled that situation and the way you were able to diffuse him. And I thought, if if you can handle him, you can handle anything. <laughs> and you're the person I want on my team. And I, you know, it was the highest compliment. Um, but really, I think surgeons um, certainly have high expectations, um, very high standards. As patients, we all certainly want that. Right. Um, sometimes the communication can be a little difficult. And I guess I have... I just find a way to figure out how to communicate with them and can usually get past the frustration and anger and really get at their problem and have just been able to, you know, work with them without issue. Well, what's kind of behind that, which is fun to, you know, it's a fun term to call and to joke about uh, me potentially being better than you, but uh, <laughs> just kidding, uh, is, but what it really means is that you're able to get their trust. And so that means you can really help them. Yeah. And it, it's so powerful. And I know that we both have seen that with you and your, um, you know, kind of ability to um, have the surgeons be open to 
advice and it really sets us up and makes it easy for us when you, when you ask us to help because they're kind of already following your lead. Mm-hmm. Well, so let's switch. You're now, uh, you have done another adventurous thing in the last year, I believe, and started your yeah. own business, uh, Brinson Anderson Consulting. Uh, tell us about that. And I'd love to just hear the kinds of services that you guys provide. Yeah. So my business partner, Cheyenne Brinson, uh, she and I were both working together uh, with Karen Zupko. And um, both of us had dreams for many years of starting a business, kind of had that entrepreneurial spirit that uh, was just waiting to break loose. And, um, you know, one of the things that we do as consultants is we go into practices, we do an overall evaluation um, and assessment, and we give recommendations. And a lot of times that's the entire scope of the work. Here's the recommendations, we debrief, we put it in writing and we kind of wish them the best of luck. And I was getting frustrated because time and time again, when I would check in a few months later, um, nothing had been done. And really realizing that doctors uh, don't often, it's not a gap of what needs to be done. It's actually how to do it, how to, implement those ideas, how to work the team through those processes. And so we started Brinson Anderson so that we could work um, on a deeper level with surgeons. Um, We kind of call ourselves virtual administrators. Um, Many of our practices are small businesses, um, either solo practitioners or small groups of doctors, and they may not have the capacity for a six-figure practice administrator to run the day-to-day operations of their practice. And so we can fill that gap um, kind of on a a part-time level, if you will, by coaching their management team, um, filling in for some HR support. We're not an HR company, um, and it doesn't replace legal HR advice, um, but we can certainly support in hiring and personnel management type things. Um, because we work with surgeons, um, plastic surgeons, as well as orthopedic surgeons, ENTs, neurosurgeons, those are kind of our core specialties. Uh, we also oversee the revenue cycle. So all things related to billing and insurance, the things that make most of us want to fall asleep, um, but how to either manage our staff internally who are doing the reimbursement um, processes, or if you have an outside billing company, we like to be the liaison Uh, with them. Most doctors will say the billing company doesn't do enough. And um, usually, again, that's just a communication gap. And so so we'll work closely with them. I find that um, in the last several months, I feel like my practice has shifted that I'm doing a lot of coaching. Um, My desire is not that doctors need me forever. I want to help them get their practice into a, a good, stable situation and equipped to move forward without me and not dependent. So um, it's coaching surgeons on how to be good business owners um, and how to be a a good leader of their own team. It's coaching managers on some, a lot of them, a lot of managers in practices um, have just been there long enough, right? They, They elevated to manager role because they've been there the longest and, you know, are, are decent at the job, but maybe don't have the formal management training. And so um, we can fill that gap by, by coaching them through handling difficult situations. Um, and then the other specific um, position I do a lot of training with is patient care coordinators. In a plastic surgery office, you know, that's kind of your salesperson and, and the lifeblood of the practice. So do a lot um, of training on, on how to enhance their skills and, and ultimately increase their surgery booking rate. All which makes sense. And, you know, you and I have been uh, on spoken at many conferences before with the plastic surgery um, groups. And uh, and it sounds like at least you have one up on Michael because you're a better uh, surgeon whisperer than him. But I know that you have you heavily work with a lot of plastic surgeons. So what is your superpower that you have with these plastic surgeons? Oh, my superpower. Um I don't know if this is exactly a superpower, but I feel like I have a unique ability to see the forest and the trees <laughs> and to take that 10,000 foot vision that the doctor has 
And I immediately go to, how can we make this happen? Mm -hmm. And because I've done all the jobs and sat in those chairs, um, I can very quickly go from big picture to granular details and uh, put together a project plan and coach the staff through how to do it. Um, I'm also, I, I sometimes joke that I'm like the three-year-old that's always asking why. Um, I'm just constantly, why do we do it that way? Well, but why? But why? And I really want a good reason, like not because it's just the way we've always done it. Yeah. Um, so I'm constantly questioning, questioning processes and asking, can we do it better? And the answer is almost always yes. Can mm -hmm. we be more efficient? Um, and so, so I guess if I had said, if I had to say I had a superpower, it's really taking that big picture and getting down into the details quickly and discerning the best path forward to make that happen. Well, before we let you go, I'm going to take advantage of that mm -hmm. superpower yes. with this question. <laughs> so this year, this season, we're, our theme is Zoom In, and mm. we're really trying to give people some, some takeaways for 2022 on some actions they can do. So with your kind of operational experience and your superpower, I'd love to – Here's some thoughts on things surgeons can focus on for 2022. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, undoubtedly 2020, the second half of 2020, 2021 has been just a roller coaster of a ride. Um, but most practices have seen unprecedented growth, right? Surgeons are busier than ever. Mm -hmm. um, and with that has come a lot of hiring, maybe some staff turnover, um, adding services, adding providers. And when you have rapid growth, um, problems can, can happen. And so uh, the biggest advice I have is, is, first of all, focusing on your people. Um, surgeons tend to hire very quickly. Um, and sometimes we should slow down that process a little bit. I, I like to say that hiring should be a lot like dating. Let's not get married on the first date. Um, let's, you know, take time and find the right person. And I also say, you've got to go with your gut. There's a lot of really good people out there, but it doesn't mean they're the right fit for you. And so, um, doing a better job at hiring, focusing on what is the skill set you need and what's the personality that's going to fit with your team and your culture. And then the next step is not just find, finding the right person but it's really investing in some training. And that's a big gap in small practices, especially because usually when we hire, we're kind of desperate for someone and we just throw them in. And then six months later, we're frustrated because they didn't ever really figure out the job. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's something I've been working with a lot of practices on of putting together a more structured training program to set people up for success. Um, I think it's the one of the best investments a surgeon can make in their practice is their people because then ultimately you know the surgeon wants to focus on patients on doing surgery and if we have a good team in place to take care of everything else then they can focus on on what they do best which is being a doctor yeah well you're that's music to our ears we 100 percent agree with you almost everything you just said on that because um, that people piece, uh, that, that, that hiring too fast could be a disaster in so many different ways. We see it uh, obviously on the legal side, on, on the, on, but you're seeing it also how it can wreck on the operational side. But, you know, Amy, um, you know, st we started this podcast with you saying this is your first one that you've ever done. I think you're lying to us. You're like <laughs> awesome at this. So you you, uh, you must have uh, done other podcasts and you failed to tell us. But it's a superpower. It is a superpower. <laughs> She's a podcast whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> you guys made it very easy thank you well we're so thankful that you could join us today absolutely and so what we'll do amy is we'll let you go and we'll break for commercial and on the other side brad and i will discuss our observations from a legal perspective many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success why for most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team, so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. 
Welcome back to Legal One Two Threes with Brad Adato. I'm your host Brad Adato. I'm still here with my co-host Michael Bird. And Michael, you know, we were so I was so thankful to Amy first off that we she joined us for her first podcast ever because as we were saying, she is she crushed it. Um, but you know, it's it's tough running a successful running a business in general, and especially when you start falling into the medical community. Um, it's 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 not very easy. Yeah, no doubt. And and I love just that she – her comment about being able to see the forest and the trees yep. because it is uh – uh, the 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 details matter you know you know i can get kind of lose my focus pretty quickly with with that uh, i'm more of a big picture guy and i don't have that same superpower but uh with this season the theme being zoom in she's a perfect guest for that and and she really had a unique perspective with her background yeah especially i mean what i loved about her in, in a lot of different ways was you're talking about someone who went literally from answering the phone to now to actually eventually to running helping run practices, and so she knows the details. And so that's she was great for that, you know, especially for this season with Zoom in, Michael. So let's let's hit that pause button like we like to do at the end of every episode, and let's talk about um, the the specific actions that um, you should be concentrating on for 2022. Well. I'm just going to jump off of her. This is maybe not as much legal as normal, mm -hmm. but it it does go back to um, there is a, there's a lot of policies that you have to have in a medical practice to maintain compliance, and there's policies you have uh, to m manage your legal risk yep. through your employee handbook, and then you just have your operational policies to you know to run your business efficiently. Mm -hmm. And she had some great thoughts on that about, you know, about executing on that. I would just say something that, you know, you and I talk about that uh, is a challenge for a lot of practices is to focus on how you're going to hold your team accountable yeah. if they don't follow your policy. So it's one mm -hmm. thing to have the piece of paper that says, here's our HIPAA compliance plan or here's our handbook, but, you know, what are we actually going to do if someone's not following it? Yeah, and I think, you know, she, she uh, following just uh, first off, I completely disagree with everything you said, but I will I would uh, agree that the, having good policies and procedures are important. Enforcing your policies and procedures are important, which means that there's something that she also said that a lot of uh, groups don't like to deal with is, which is the training side of it. You know that educational aspect of of you you being the practice hitting that pause button finding once a week to sit down with your team for thirty minutes it's hard we all get it that you're you're running so fast to keep the lights on but by slowing down and and training your team as to what are the expectations letting them know hey this is a policy procedure that we have. Um, which is why, of course, we started Bertadotti University because we think training is so important um, for our own employees. And so I think she nailed that is when you bring on these new hires, they need to understand it. And then while they're still there, they continually have to understand it so that six months later, you're wondering why this person you hired can't do their job. Did you ever reflect? Did you ever train them properly? Yeah, and I think we need to acknowledge the first vocabulary word for the day. When Brad said he completely disagrees with something, <laughs> that means he begrudgingly agrees. <laughs> so those of you who haven't heard us before are probably wondering what in the world Brad just mentioned. I only just completely disagree with you. I know, I know, <laughs> yes. So I agree with everything Amy said, though, for the record. Okay, got it. He, he does not begrudgingly agree with Amy. He agrees with Amy. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, let's – you know, putting a bow on it, Brad, we started talking about jumping off of uh, big uh, waterfalls and girlfriends from Niagara Falls. And more more than that, just the being adventurous. And it can be adventurous to deal with human issues in your business mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and A, to engage them directly, create the policies, and, of course, actually hold people to them is challenging, but it's worth it for the business. And uh, if you don't believe us, believe Amy because yeah. she's awesome at her job. Totally agree with that. Well, thankful that she could join us again. But 
Um, for next Wednesday, our show will address protecting your network from cyber attacks. We have Gary Salman with us. It's going to be awesome. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe. Make sure to give us a five-star rating and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadato newsletter by going to our website at bertadato.com. Bertadato is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadato. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.